Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with Calvin We the Species. Um, and, and it never gets, well, uh, 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 um, my fists are clenched uh, in excitement and anticipation because I've been looking for it. Yes, we're they're clenched. I'm with Josh Mills. Uh, what a history. Uh, Josh <laughs> is the son of Edie Adams, uh, and Edie Adams was married to uh, one of TV's greatest pioneers and most innovative. He was a writer, journalist. He was a million different things. I watched Ernie Kovacs in the 50s. And, and, and the images, I was just telling Josh, the images are, are so powerful for me because I, I grew up and, and loved Ernie Kovacs and, and some of his characters. Percy kind of resonates with me. So when, when Josh and I kind of got, got together a couple of weeks ago, and, and oh, wow, for me. <laughs> because to well because it, it's royalty and your whole life journey which we're going to talk about and unpack you know the things you you're doing uh and and most importantly we're here to talk about our uh, Ernie and Kovacs land yes uh, on on Amazon uh which is a wonderful it's probably uh as i said it, it's probably one of the quintessential coffee table books because it's it's about pictures and drawings and photos of uh, uh, of Ernie and, and talks and, and stories about Ernie that that never have been really delved into before. So we're gonna jump into all this and and, sure. and the celebrities and Hollywood. There's so much stuff to unpack. So this has been we just talked about Johnny Carson. This has been my Johnny Carson monologue. Oh, Sultan of Secaucus, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, thank sure. you. It's, so uh, I'm done. Uh, Josh, why don't you jump in uh, and do a little background bio stuff? And sure. It. Yeah. Uh, really excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, my mom was, uh, uh, as she was known in the New York Times um, crossword puzzle, uh, Songstress Adams. Um, she was a singer. She was an entertainer. Uh, she was a comedian. And um, she was, um, you know, in movies like you, if you saw The Apartment or It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World or Love with a Proper Stranger, uh, which, by the way, incredibly timely right now. If you can see one movie uh, from, from the past, Love with a Proper Stranger is probably one you need to see because we're living through it with the Supreme Court. Uh, anyway. Uh, and she was married to uh, a comedian named Ernie Kovacs before I was born. So my mom uh, was a Juilliard trained uh, singer. She married Ernie, uh, did his show first in uh, um, Trenton. And then, well, she was actually in Philadelphia. He started in Trenton uh, and he was in radio and then he was in television. And so Ernie is not my father, but I run both my mom and Ernie Kovacs estates. Um, I also run my father's estate. He was a photographer. Maybe we'll talk about him. Uh, but I'm happy to talk about this book that's uh, that's out, um, Ernie Kovacs Land from Fantagraphics. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit so people. There's a lot of people here who won't know. Sure, Ernie. But but uh, the the stuff I've read and learned. Uh, there's a whole slew of people today who have learned and in part learned from Ernie Kovacs. So he, uh, I mean, Jimmy Kimmel, I'm just throwing some names. Even Johnny Carson uh, was a big fan of uh, Ernie Kovacs. And Scorsese, Martin Scorsese, one of the great directors of all time, you know, had things to say and learned from, from Ernie Kovacs. So um, talk a little bit about his background, his history, kind of fill us yeah. in. And of course, I'm always attracted uh, and drawn to Ernie Kovacs because he's a Jersey guy. Yes, uh, in born America. in Trenton. Yeah, the Rutgers hat. We we we. I love it. Representing. Um, yeah, Ernie was born in Trenton uh, in 1919. Uh, he was from Hungarian parents who emigrated, and um, Ernie, unlike most comedians of the era, was not a stand-up. He was not a guy that actually ever could tell a joke. He was not that person at all. Uh, but what he was good at and what he figured out uh, being on television, he, he did start at the Trentonian. He was a writer. 
Um, and then he started to do some radio. Uh, I think it's WTTM in uh, Trenton at the time. And then he got into this new thing called television. Um, but unlike, you know, again, stand-up comics of the area era who they put on television and sort of um, pre presented it like a play, you know, like Ernie broke the fourth wall. Ernie was someone who basically said, we're all in this together. You know, there's no division between the audience and uh, the performer. So he was talking to you directly. He was uh, not pretending that uh, this artificial thing was anything other than being artificial. So uh, he was unique in that way. And he really became known for his visual uh, gags, his visual comedy, which is interesting because in the 1950s, television was just starting and who knew how to use the medium? Ernie figured out how to use the medium. So uh, unlike uh, uh, the Honeymooners, and I'm not putting anybody down, I don't mean it like that, but when you say the Honeymooners, you go, oh, a half hour show on, you know, I think it was CBS and, you know, you knew exactly what you got. Ernie, you didn't know what you got. He was on four different networks. He was on uh, 15 minute <laughs> episodes. He had a 60 minute episode on ABC. He had all these different things going on. So uh, the thing that Ernie's best known for, I would say, is his visual humor uh, and his sort of Dadaist type humor. Okay. Uh, did I read somewhere that uh, some of his things, a lot of his things were uh, actually improvisational, just... Well, Ernie was a big fan of... First of all, he never... He didn't like writers. He liked writing stuff himself. Uh, and there's a famous quote that he said, which was, the best stuff I ever came up with was 15 minutes before I had to go on air. And it was live. Um, so... It may have been slightly thought out, but not by much. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and those characters, just so enduring and powerful. Uh, and, and, you know, somebody could write a book with, even on, on, on the characters. And I keep on yeah. going back to Percy because to me it was just, uh, I just got a kick out of that. Uh, um, and, and I can see it. And, and by the way, people... Folks can to familiarize. You know, YouTube is replete with with old clips and, and yeah. stuff. So I mean, Ernie was he has there are favorite characters. Percy Dove Tonsils, a uh, poet laureate, and uh, the Nairobi Trio, which is a bizarre <laughs> skit uh, involving yeah. gorilla outfits and and breaking milk bottles and things like that. Uh, and he had a few other ones. He had a great German disc jockey named Wolfgang Sauerbraten. Uh, he had a Hungarian chef named Miklos Molnar. Um, so he had a lot of those sketches. Um, but he, you know, he's also really known at the very end of his life. Ernie died uh, young. He died at, uh, I think it was 42, almost 43, uh, in 1962 in January. And he had the series of ABC specials which were visually and technically very difficult. There was very little editing. There was obviously no real special effects. A lot of his gags were done uh, syncopated. Like there's one at Kitchen Symphony where, you know, the music is timed with the action and it's done live. And wow. that's really what Ernie is sort of known for. Uh, those are his high watermarks. Uh, but he, he, you know, he was on NBC on a daily show in the 50s. He was on ABC radio. He did a lot of stuff. So yeah, check him out. Yep. And it's there. And, and, and people should check him out. It's just wonderful. And again, uh, I said, may have said this before, uh, completely, totally timeless. Yeah. You can turn on your TV today and see Ernie Kovacs and you laugh. Because he's timeless. And, and that's to his credit that he has this enduring comedy. Yeah. Well, he he wasn't um, in any way political. In fact, Ernie, one of his quotes was like, the only the only anybody who takes himself serious deserves a pie in the face. And that was politicians. That was his politics. If you took yourself seriously, you deserved a pie in the face. Right. But other than that, it's it's very. Uh, I think it's left brain uh, comedy, I would say. Yeah. Well, and again, another one of the I, I think one of his 
why I, and again, I was a young kid watching him, but, uh, uh, and he wasn't quote political and he didn't do political stuff. So it, it's, so there's just more reasons to love the guy because he's, he's making you laugh. Uh, yeah. We'll talk a little bit. Uh, there's some people have some really interesting things to say about it. And we'll talk about that. Uh, sure. next up, let's talk about uh, your mom. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about Edie. Uh, about, so everything I've learned, and of course I've learned a lot more than, than I knew, but your mom was quite amazing. I'm not saying it because you're sitting here, but uh, if there are any tragic uh, accident, uh, she's left and, and and she keeps everything together and, and, and her career explodes and, and all the things. She was so possessed to succeed and take care of you all and, and the estate. Yeah. So talk about your mom. Well, you know, the book that we're talking about, Ernie and Kovacs Land, is really uh, as much her book as it is Ernie's book. Yes. Um, and it's because my mom was a bit of a preservationist. She wasn't a hoarder by any means, uh, but she did hoard uh, stuff about Ernie and her life and everything from her stage worn costumes to um, Ernie's you know, gas cards. And that's the reason we did this book. It was a tribute to the genius of Ernie, but it was also a bit of a tribute to my mom because she preserved it. And and look, he came up with it. He did all this stuff. My mom was there when he was doing a lot of it and editing him a bit off camera. Uh, but it was really her preservation efforts that uh, were the reason we have the shows, first of all, because my mom in 1964 found out that the networks were taping over yeah. Ernie's uh, yeah. shows. And so she got a quick claim and went to ABC, NBC, CBS, anywhere there was a library and said, anything that says Kovacs, I'll buy. And the networks were like, great, free money. Like, we, don't, no one's ever going to use this stuff again. And that's the reason that stuff exists. Um, we also just found that we have uh, an audio archive of my mom's and Ernie shows, which is a great new discovery. Um, but my mom, you know, she was a lot more than Ernie Kovacs too. She, she, you know, when Ernie did pass away, he was in debt. Uh, the IRS was owed about 350,000. He owed ABC about 150,000. This is 1962 money. And my mom basically went on the road and took jobs she had to take, not jobs she wanted to take, but the thing that people I think most, well, they might know her from her Muriel cigar commercials. That was a, a big deal. But uh, she uh, she said the first time she ever laughed after Ernie died was when she started to go on set of It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World because you had Milton Berle and Jonathan Winters and Phil Silvers and Sid Caesar and Terry Thomas and Dick Shaw. I mean, it was like one after another after another. And she just like, she said that was the best medicine. She, she's like, I... I I was in a dark place and, and it really came out of it. I mean, Mickey Rooney, we could keep oh. going on. Uh, yeah. Buddy Hackett. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I, you, you mentioned that movie. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how many people today know about that, but uh, about three or four times a year, I, I do watch it. Uh, one of the great. It's a long comedy, but it's. It's a it's, long. <laughs> and supposedly there was like a five hour version which they cut down but uh 245 is a long comedy but uh absolutely priceless yeah i mean yeah and, and even uh there was even uh a quick vignette with, with jerry lewis um i think it was jerry lewis runs over uh spencer i mean spencer tracy's in the movie oh yeah spencer tracy jimmy Durante. uh uh oh. ethel merman yeah uh, it's just again one after another and great cameos from the three stooges to carl reiner there's just everybody in it everybody in it, it it's pri it's priceless it's absolutely priceless yeah right into the last scene but it's it's something great to watch uh and when it now actually when it came out uh and i remember it was a big splash in new york city they had it on cinerama it was a whole it, yes in fact uh the first cinerama theater was in hollywood called the cinerama dome and it opened the dome and i believe if i'm not mistaken it was the same week as the kennedy assassination so there was a bit of a pall oh, yeah. <laughs> over the proceedings but the show kind of had to go on it was i mean that was probably our version 
or my version would be 9-11, but the Kennedy assassination, obviously, yeah. pretty intense, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yep. Um, so uh, I rewatched. Uh, I rewatched what I think is one of the funniest skits. You could <laughs> look. One of the funniest skits ever uh, is your mom Edie Adams uh, as Marilyn Monroe doing the ballad of Davy Crockett. Uh, <laughs> yes. It, you can see it online. What? Um, it, it's it's phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, very meta, very, even today, it's very weird. But the thing was, my mom was a, a I, I can say this now, my mom was a very good looking lady. A lot of people thought she was very attractive. So uh, they kind of thought of her a bit of, as a dumb blonde in a lot of ways. But my mom was a great impressionist. She was very smart. And uh, her Marilyn Monroe uh, is great. And the audience, it's great because the audience, like, pretty quickly picks up like how good it is and they're like going crazy it's it, it's a great clip it's a great clip and people just go go to youtube and, and, and go find a clip it's yeah really you know for the un uh the un uh discernible viewer if you just kind of superficially look at it you, you kind of think it's my own one row she was great <laughs> no she was really great she picked up all the, the nuances the voice the whole the whole, yeah. the whole package, it, it, it was a great clip. People should watch that. Uh, yeah. So before we move on, I, I always like to ask this this question, and and, and, and I'm going to fess up, and, and if you'll take my confession. Um, my, my confession is I, I borrowed this question from one of the great interviewers of all time who recently passed, uh, initials BW. Um, uh, I was a big fan of Barbara Walters, so uh, and, and I watched a lot of her, her stuff. But he, here's the question, and actually, you don't even have to answer it, or you could answer a couple different answers. But I, I like it because uh, it's it's insightful. So, uh, Josh, excluding family or friends, somebody living or dead you'd like to spend a day with? Maybe I know the answer. Right. Anyway. You know, it's funny. I. Uh... If I was younger, I might have said, uh, you know, one of the Lakers or, you know, maybe Joe DiMaggio. Uh, I'd still yeah. would love to see Joe DiMaggio. Uh, but, you know, it's it's weird. Uh, that's a good question. I was lucky because so so Ernie Kovacs and, and I will get to the point, I promise. Ernie Kovacs was very good friends with Jack Lemon. In fact, before um, Lemon and Mathau. Lemon and Kovacs did like four films. And so there was a great friendship. Uh, the wife, my, my, my mom and um, Jack's wife, Felicia, were great friends. Everybody got along. And so I grew up uh, going to Jack Lemon's house uh, for Christmas. That was just what we did. Um, wow. He was usually making a movie through the year. And occasionally we saw him uh, through the year. But it was every Christmas. And I remember those being very warm, fun things, but I also was very aware that, holy shit, this is Jack Lemon and I'm in his house. Um, but I guess in a way I'd probably, I'll tell you a really quick, funny story. When I was 15, uh, Jack was in Italy making a movie with Marcello Mastroani called Macaroni. Not a great film but it was a great vehicle for him to work with Marcello Mastroani in Italy and he said why don't you guys come over here meet us there so we go for Christmas so here me my mom a good friend of mine Sean Barth we're in Italy with Jack Lemon, and we're at this hotel in Venice the Gritty Palace which is ridiculous and there's Christopher Walken who's shooting um, A View to a Kill the Bond movie and Gore Vidal shows up and mm -hmm. this super agent, Sue Mengers, who was everybody's agent in the 70s and 80s. And I was just sort of like 15. I kind of I mean, I got it, but I was like, this is pretty cool. Anyway, there was one night where we went out it was New Year's Eve and I was uh, I was in a Sammy Davis Jr. phase. I was really into Sammy and I took a picture with Jack and my friend Sean. And I wasn't thinking, and I said, 
thanks, Jack. And I did some sort of Sammy impression. And Sean started to laugh and I started to laugh. And Jack is laughing and he doesn't know why. And my mom is laughing and we're crying. And I was like, that was a really great moment in my life that I'd love to go back to. I thought that was such a trippy, weird time. Wow. I, I'm, I'm such a groupie. <laughs> no, I uh, I am what I am. Uh, I'm one of Hollywood's great groupies, supporters. Listen, I wrote my first novel. I think I mentioned to you. Yeah. Uh, that changed my whole life around. I wrote my first novel 16, 17 years ago uh, uh, after I watched Casablanca. Casablanca, right, yeah. And and uh, and and you know I snuck into a uh, Meryl Streep movie. Did I tell you that? I don't know if it did. I don't think so. No. Uh, long story. I, I'm not here. To, we're here to. But I snuck into. It's called One True Thing, and and she was nominated for the Academy Award. She plays a she plays a woman uh, who's dying of cancer, and her husband, um, uh, uh, her daughter, and her husband. You know they have to kind of. Uh, uh, take care of her and she's dying in this little town. The, the point being, it, it was filmed in my hometown uh, of Maplewood, New Jersey, one of my hometowns. And I just went to watch them film it because I was so interested in, in all the work they did and the facades. I mean, the, everything. It was just so fascinating. And in the middle of everything, they, they said, there's an hour off. You can go get a slice of pizza because it, it took the whole town square. It was a Christmas mm. And uh, they they took the uh, uh, Renee Zellweger's in it. Carl Franklin was the director. Uh, William Hurt uh, um, was the husband. A uh, powerful, powerful, powerful movie. So my sister and I just, you know, we, we got a slice of pizza. We we're watching the machine making snow. It's a Christmas scene. It, it was fat for me, you know. Just yeah. I from Jersey it was so fascinating. And and after an hour and a half of chewing the same slice of pizza, it was a. I, I call it New Jersey's mastication, pizza mastication record. We just chewed one slice for an hour and a half. <laughs> and we went out, uh, my sister and I, we went to watch them getting ready to film the, the scene with Meryl Streep and and and, uh, uh, and 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 I'm watching and it's sudden, and they were inside the theater. It was an old the, the, the center of this was an old movie theater, uh, Art Deco kind of thing. And 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 I you feel there's a presence next to you. And I, I look and Meryl Streep is standing right next to me. Yeah. You know, how do you deal with that? So I, I'm not shy. Uh, and I, I just told her, I, I, you know, I was like for clumped uh, <laughs> Saturday Night Live. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was for clumped. And, and I say, Hey, you know, I'm, I, 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 I'm such a fan uh, of your work. Uh, I don't even know what to say. I'm, I'm, and while I was saying that a, a production assistant, saw that I was talking to her and and um, he assumed I was part of that entourage. So he comes over to me and says, you know, we got to place you now. So <laughs> I said, my sister is shot in the ribs. Let's get placed. We got placed. Uh, and 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 I wasn't satisfied being uh, uh, an, an extra in the scene. I said, if I've come this far, I might as well go for the, the gusto. So I you actually see me kind of pushing my way right up front in the movie. <laughs> And I placed myself fairly close uh, to where Meryl Streep was. And Meryl's. Anyway, uh, but that's my passion and love. I I was always someone who uh, loved autographs, and I was a big fan myself. Uh, and my parents totally indulged me. Um, I've had my dad once had one time I was at home, and he someone's like, "Oh, someone's on the phone for you," and he had Pat Summerall, the CBS announcer, call me and Josh, it's Pat Summerall. How are you? And I was like, I don't know what to say, but well, you know, but my parents, I'm a big fan too. Believe me, I totally okay. get it. Okay. Uh, yeah, and and that 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 whole thing has fueled it has fueled me because whenever I have any self-doubts or, or anything in life to overcome hurdles, hey, I you know, I co-star with Mel Street. Yeah, of course you did. So there you go. Uh yeah. Um Moving on, um, let's now talk about the energies, because I'm always fascinated by this because I do some writing. The energies uh, in Ernie and Kovacs land, how, yeah. where, when, why, uh, everything that percolated, yeah. developed. Well, um, I when my mom passed away in 2008, uh, she had a 
fairly large house. And like I said, she didn't really throw things away. And I mean, tax returns and from the 50, I mean, just so much stuff, but they were audited and, and, you know, everybody complaining about our tax situation. Now she and Ernie were in a 90% tax bracket. So every dollar that they made, they were being taxed 90 cents. So my mom was like, I am not getting audited. <laughs> and she kept everything. Um, but I had all this stuff and I have a much smaller house than the house I grew up in. And I started to look through a lot of these things and I thought, gosh, there's so much cool stuff here and I love it, but I'm the only one that really gets to see it. And it's kind of silly. So we decided uh, to scan a bunch of this stuff. Um, I reached out to two people, Pat Thomas, who is a co-author, curator, uh, editor. Um, and he took a deep dive with me. And I also work with our Kovacs and Edie Adams uh, archivist, Ben Modell, who did a lot of the captioning and really helped like lock in a lot of the information in the book. But I really just felt like there was stuff here that my mom preserved that Ernie did. And I really wanted to make sure people saw it. Um, and it's everything from a novel he started to write called Mildred Zabo, which he didn't actually, I think there are 10 pages or maybe 12, but we included that in this. Mm. Uh, there's great photos. There's drawings he did. There's even things like Ernie drawing and sketching out uh, how he wants his record collection displayed in the house. Um, so there's all this behind the scenes stuff and in front of the camera stuff. Uh, a lot of articles that he wrote in the 50s for publications that don't exist anymore. So we just thought, you know, let's throw this all together. And it's very much like taking a peek, I think, into Ernie's brain. It's not chronological. It's not put together like television or film. And it's the next chapter and the next one of his personal life. It's all kind of thrown in there and it kind of feels like a good jumping off point for people who don't know who he is. And for people who do know who he is, they are, it's like a feast because there's stuff you've never seen for sure. Okay. Uh, I'm really shy about it and, and, and I will be. Uh, Me too. Yeah. Really, really, uh, really excited about it because like I said, even if I, I came from there, but even if I didn't to, to, to try to get a grasp, of a mind uh, of his mind and what he accomplished uh i, I think it I, I think it's just great and it's eclectic and and uh and and i think the world needs some good coffee table books more now than ever before yeah i agree um and it was a pleasure putting it together i mean it took a long time uh but it's really good it's i mean it's not like you know, a five hundred table, five hundred dollar coffee table book. It's thirty five dollars. Um, it's but it's great, and it it it's Fantagraphics is the book company, and they do right. great work. Um, so I I think people are really going to like it. I do think right. that again, if you know who he is, there's absolutely stuff you've never seen before because I had never seen it. Um, and then there's things for people that don't know who he is that I think are going to go. Wait a minute, I I, I want to know more. Right, right. Which, um. A little background where where uh, Ernie is archived in, in lots of different places. Can you, um, I know like UCLA and stuff and um, where can people find more Ernie stuff? Yeah, well, a couple things. So uh, when my mom, after Ernie died and my mom was sort of moving on with her life, there was a point where there were things that were, you know, frankly, a lot of it was um, condolence cards about his death. Um, then there were condolence cards about uh, my sister's death, uh, which was Ernie and my mom's daughter, who's my half sister, Mia Kovacs. Um, and she basically was like, I can't, I don't need these around me, but I want them to be preserved. So she gave a lot of stuff to the UCLA Film and Television Archive. First, it was called Special Collections. Now it's the Film and Television Archive. So there's a lot of stuff there. Um, we also uh, worked at the Library of Congress. Um, one of the things about, uh, so my mom had a production company called EDAD Productions, and I run that. And we are a production company, but we're not Disney and we're not, you know, <laughs> Discovery or Warner or whatever they're calling themselves these days, uh, HBO Max, I don't know. But we, we worked with the Library of Congress, so we have all of our archive 
permanently stored there. I own it. They own the physical tape that's there. Um, so we are trying to find places for it because quite frankly, you know, I'm not getting any younger and I don't want this stuff to go away and I need to make sure that it's preserved in some way. And part of the book is part of that process too. It's making sure that, you know, all this stuff that was saved for now 60 plus years exists. Okay. Yeah. Um, which is more of that. I, you know, I couldn't, but you know, you said this earlier, I, I just couldn't believe that, you know, studios would get rid of that stuff. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I can't. Um, I, I you was, know what, though? I got to tell you something. People are so even today, you know, you 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 execute a document and someone is paranoid about like making sure the signatures are done and then, you know, make sure you're initial here. All these companies are sold. I mean, whether it's TV Guide or whether it's Warner Brothers or whatever, I guarantee you those people don't really know where half the stuff is because people it just gets lost and people yeah. go, ah, that was the other regime. I don't need that. Or, I mean, there's so much that needs to be saved that isn't. Um, you know, there were entire, there are people that have entire collections of photography that were literally dumpster divers that went into like Capitol Records trash cans and wow. went like, oh, look, oh, there's the, Moby Grape photo from that session, or there's the mm. grape, but you know, with the Beach Boys or whatever. And you, you'd be amazed at how much is still being thrown away. And nobody's really preserving stuff the way they should. Wow. Yeah. Oh, but well. specifically for Ernie, I'll just say uh, studios in the 1960s, you know, essentially, you, if you had videotape, and before that, there was something called Kinescope, which was a literally a six like a, a film canister uh shot uh, uh of the television uh screen those things are just sort of like didn't exist because like <laughs> if you showed them once what if maybe would you ever rerun them they didn't think so and maybe it got sent to the west coast for you know a west coast airing mm -hmm. but they just thought it's all gone i mean look the bbc is finding stuff that they ship to Africa and all these other territories because they threw it all away in England. And now it's coming back because some guy kept it in South Africa or wherever. So it's it's a worldwide problem. Maybe it's a species problem. Uh, yes. We just don't. Uh... Monty Python only exists because Terry Jones was the one that's like said, give me the copies. And he, that's the only reason those shows exist. Wow. Um, uh, uh, a, a very prominent SNL, you can talk about this. Uh, I, I love quotes, and I'm always searching the universe and the desert and the mountaintops for great quotes. And I'm, I'm, I, I can recite a few, but uh, somebody from SNL says something really great. Uh, about Ernie, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, a friend of ours, uh, Alan Zweibel, a uh, great comedy writer. He's actually on a bunch of episodes of the early years. Uh, was best friends with Gilda Radner, co-wrote her show. He's written books. Um, he told my mom uh, in the, in the 1980s uh, when he was doing It's Gary Shandling Show as a co-creator and co-writer. Uh, they wanted to have my mom on, be frankly, because of her connection to Ernie and she was on his show and it connected to an episode they did. But my mom became friendly with him. And one of the things he told her was when we were stumped in the writer's room early in the years of SNL, wow. we would just say, what would Ernie do? And wow. that's kind of how we figured out what we wanted to do. And my mom was like, that's, <laughs> couldn't have a better uh, quote than that. Wow. That's just great, and 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 that's now filed up here for me, uh, as I go for what would Ernie do? Uh, that's a great, it's a really great quote, testament yeah. to to Ernie Kovacs. Um, I feel like Ralph Edwards now. Do you remember him? No, oh, of course. Things I, that aren't here watched, anymore. I just watched Ralph Edwards the other night. I I I I'm, I, I go to sleep at three o'clock in the morning, uh, and and I'm always foraging around not for food in, in, in the forest, but I'm foraging around okay. for things that that are part of my life. 
So I watched Ralph Edwards. Uh, and, and honestly, Josh, I don't know how, where, why this stuff pops into my consciousness. I Maybe I need to see somebody to help me. But but uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning the other night, I, I found Ralph Edwards. Uh, this is your life, Lou Costello. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, n n not, not to praise myself, but uh, 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 I think I'm world's better than that kind of stuff was back then i don't know uh it was nice been sweet and innocent but um it was real basic yeah you know it's funny it's funny you brought him up. i was thinking of ralph's story by the way he was another announcer here but yes ralph edwards i definitely know because my mom and ernie had a pact which was if anyone comes to you and says we want to do you bet your life the other one had to say, absolutely not. <laughs> they did not have any interest in doing that at all. That is so funny. Yeah. Uh, it, it was uh, the it it was actually poor. I uh, mean, the quality, the the staging, and uh, uh, it, it whatever. Yeah. But I I, I love uh, you know I grew up to Lou Costello as well. Uh, yeah. No. And, and uh, nothing wrong with it, but uh, uh, they were just. They were also the people like if there was a, a musician in a restaurant, someone playing the violin or mariachis, Ernie was like, you know, here's 20 bucks. Please go somewhere else. Like, I I just want to enjoy my dinner. Don't I don't I don't want you to appear playing to my wife. Thank you. Funny. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, next up. So this is your life. I, that's I got sidetracked. Uh, so talk it about, feels like this is my life. Yes. So talk about yourself, uh, your work. Uh, yeah. Uh, your dad, uh, Martin Mills, uh, what a, a phenomenal photographer. And I went looking and saw some of his work. Uh, yeah. and, and you have a, a project now, it's called Toy Project. And, and you can do all of that. And then the second part of this long, uh, you, you have a wonderful podcast that, that more and more oh. people should know about. Thank uh, you. Uh, Rarefied Air. Uh, and of course, in doing my research about you, I started to listen to some of those it's a wow you're you're interviewing you can talk about it uh it's brilliant and and it's so needed because thank you you know uh you know it is it's so needed and 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 synchronistically uh, when i first knew we were going to be doing our thing i i went to to rarefied air and, and one of your, your later ones was uh, jim jim garner's uh, james garner's uh, daughter and Gigi. Yeah. The night before you talk about synchronicity the night before i discovered you and and that uh i watched one of my favorite movies the americanization of, of emily james a great Gordon. one just and i don't think it gets enough play today but it's no. marvelous marvelous yeah. movie i love it i'm trying to get my son and daughter in law to watch it because it, it's just he's priceless completely yeah, it's interesting. That's a film. I mean, just a personal aside, but, you know, it's sort of the kind of thing where you would look at it and go, I don't know if this is going to work with James Garner and Julie Andrews. And it works perfectly. And they're great together. And wow. uh, he's, you know, this sort of brash American and she's the amazing, you know, uh, Florence Nightingale type uh, uh, army nurse. And uh, it works. It, it's It's a great film. A great film and she's a, a prig and I, I didn't know what that word meant but she was the perfect prig you know somebody very prudish i guess yes yes uh, and and he was a and, and people should watch it even for the historical uh, oh sure because uh, i don't know i don't think too many people know what a dog robber was a dog robber was somebody who had to come up with stuff during wartime to keep the generals happy and it was above and beyond uh i mean it, it, it's right down to perfume yeah and clothing yeah uh, and food and and if you're having dinner to have the the proper uh china uh yeah. stemware uh and this that's james garner and it's funny he, he and maybe he was typecast because uh in, in the great escape he also was that he also oh yeah yeah right about yeah. that yeah. you know and, uh, yeah and I'm, I'm thinking about it as i'm talking to you josh uh yeah. but uh, i i love so but anyway Talk about yourself. Well, uh, well, the podcast, Rarefied Air, uh, it basically started because I, I, I had friends that I grew up with that uh, were children of celebrities, and I didn't really think much of it. I didn't 
think much of it as a, being a kid. And even if I, I grew up with people who, even if their parents weren't celebrities, you know, maybe one was a lawyer and had worked with Marlon Brando or, you know what I mean? Like random stuff. But I started to kind of have this moment where, you know, yes, there's this great, silly, ridiculous side of it that I that I love. But also, like, what does it mean to be a child of a celebrity? Or how did someone feel about being the child of a celebrity? And we interviewed Victoria Price. So I've done 100 and right now 132 episodes. We interviewed Victoria Price, uh, Vincent Price's daughter. And she said something, and this is why I love doing the podcast. Uh, she said, I felt like a brand ambassador for my family. And I went like, she said it and it had a little click in my head and I was like, yes, exactly. And what she meant was you couldn't screw up because you represented the brand, which was your family. And even that dichotomy is weird. So I, it's, I love having these conversations uh, about weird revelations uh, that I'm having, but also you know, silly stuff like, you know, uh, her, you know, I talked to um, Kiki Ebsen, uh, Buddy Ebsen's daughter, who told this crazy story about taking Lee, Mer Lee Merriweather's kids on a horse, uh, like a horse riding day, and it just went completely wrong. And it's just stories and weirdness that like, it could be deep, it could be silly, it could be uh, funny, it could be very serious. Uh, but I, I'm just curious, like what it means to be a celebrity child's it's celebrity great. child. Yeah, I think it's I think it's fabulous because there's so much curiosity, you know, above and beyond, you know, the New York Post page six or whatever. Yeah. Is, you know, but just to get that kind of insight, because it, it it's because we're all fascinated by celebrity. But, you know, these are the children of celebrity. I, I, I just think it's a marvelous concept. And, and thank you. And I will be yeah. a regular denizen there i mean you know it's literally everything from what kind of car did buddy ebsen drive like what did your dad drive growing up which is hysterical and you wouldn't know it uh to yeah my dad <laughs> pulled the gun on my mom and i and started shooting at us not buddy ebsen uh but you know it, as we were leaving the house so it can get very deep so it just it runs the gamut from yeah, sure. silly to very deep sure. Yeah. Just, I just all I just brilliant. I think it's Thank a you. brilliant, brilliant, Thank you. brilliant Thank uh, you. a podcast, and, and I will become uh, um, in my own way. Um, so we've we've. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, um, and just uh, I'm looking at my notes. Uh, you know, and, uh, as uh, hanging out, you used to hang out in Clint, Clint, Clint Eastwood's house, Jack Clark's. <laughs> I mean, you're you're. Your indoctrination, you're part of that whole world. Fascinating. Just fascinating. As you are. Oh, well. Not really. No, I, I, I think this is great. I appreciate it. I, I don't feel particularly fascinating, oh. I, but I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, but yeah, there are those moments. I mean, I'm I'm I am writing a book with a, a childhood friend of mine, Seth Kupchick, uh, called Toy Children, and it's about growing up in the 70s in LA. Um, and in one of the stories, I recount uh, this really interesting moment where my mom was really good friends with this musician, Slide Hyde, who played on a gazillion uh, a gazillion albums, uh, sort of the go to horn guys in L.A. And he ended up playing on Super Tramp's uh, Breakfast in America record. And that's probably 77. So I was young. I was like eight or nine. And Slide invited my mom and my stepfather and me to a party. And it was for the the, the people, the, the album, the sorry, the band, Supertramp. So they were all there. We didn't know. The album had really had maybe just come out or was about to come out. And it was a typical 70s party. I kind of was like relegated to the bedroom watching TV while the parents did whatever they did, you know. And we're, I mean, there were a bunch of other kids just watching TV. And out of the blue, Clint Eastwood walks in and goes, do you mind if I sit and watch with you? Because he was totally bored. Oh, wow. And I was like, holy shit. It's, you know. Wow. Any which way but loose. It's you know I was I couldn't believe it. Um, 
So these are the weird little moments where you kind of go like, is this normal? I don't think so. Um, but yeah, those are the, the, the crazy things. So it's just recounting, the book is basically recounting not just anecdotes, but what it was like to be sort of a toy ch child, like where you were, where you were a bit of an accoutrement to your parents as well in the seventies. So great, great premise, great premise. Yeah. And hey, uh, when that gets done, come back here. We can talk about that. I love so, it. Uh, my last thing uh, uh, is at some point, because you're there and I'm here, at some point you're coming to New Jersey. So yes. We are looking into many uh, live events for the COVAX uh, launch. Uh, we are going to do something with the UCLA Film and Television Archive. We have some events in LA and San Francisco and Seattle. Uh, but we are looking to do an event at Randy's Man Cave in New Jersey. Uh, he was in Bordentown or just outside of Bordentown. But uh, Randy is awesome. And when we had our uh, Ernie Kovacs 2019 Centennial event in Trenton, uh, at the uh, State House, uh, it was a really great event. Uh, Randy also did an event at his uh, old location, and you know had an Ernie cake, and he's just this great guy. And 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 I'm really looking forward to going into his store because he's got a great store anyway, and it's all yeah, so pop culture. There. Yeah, I've been there with great. Danny Coleman, you know our friend. Uh, Danny That's Coleman. right. That's Danny. I Danny did a, a show from there, and I went to support. Dan. Actually, I was co-hosting. I forgot. You know, I co-hosted with Danny. Uh, we should, that we is should thank Danny. People. Yep. We no, we should just thank Danny for connecting us. Uh, I I we're thanking Danny Coleman right now. I always thank Danny Coleman. Danny Coleman was so instrumental, uh, and in, when I started out in journalism. But uh, anyway, I love the guy. Yeah. So it's all it all fits. So uh, I will see you. Yes. You come to Jersey. There's no doubt about that. Um, so I will see you and I'll tell you some Bordentown town stories when I see you. Um, uh, I can't ghost think stories. I hope no, there, there are ghost stories. There oh, are, I know. We, we, we talked a little bit about it. I'm ready to about that. some real potent ghost stories, but to be continued. Yes. Uh, thank you, Josh. Thank you. Oh. Uh, reminding everybody once again, uh, uh, Ernie and Kovacs land. Yeah. Uh, this will be an addition from, from my Corky Table book. Uh, I'm excited about it. I, I'm thrilled to have met you. Uh, yes. And uh, uh, to be continued, come back anytime you want. Uh, I sit in this chair. Uh, <laughs> I actually just put uh, masking tape on the arms. It's worn out. <laughs> I mean, really, I would actually lift You can actually see it. You, you see I'm pointing to the masking tape? You think I'm you, you I'm might guessing? Need... You, you might need a board in town poster or somewhere along the line. Oh, so, uh, yeah. yeah. So, come back. Uh, thank you so much. Truly. Absolutely. Thank you, Calvin. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, man. My pleasure. Uh, don't leave. We're just going to stop recording. We're going to do a wrap. Yeah. I love saying that. We're doing a wrap. We're wrap. Thanks, Josh.